Hello and welcome. We're so glad that you could join us today. Today we are going to be in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. If you want to follow along in your Bibles, we'll be in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I hope that you join us each and every week and you've got your Bibles close by, perhaps a pad of paper and a pen, and you can jot down notes, jot down items of interest that you may want to look up on your own. Or if you have questions, you can ask those in the comments section of the video. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Now we're going to be reading the last verses of chapter 5 and then continuing on into chapter 6. You know, back when I first went into the ministry, and this was way back in the 1980s, I had a ministry friend from another church who told me about having to drive to Cincinnati one day. And he went to the hospital to visit a couple of folks in, that were a part of their church. And after he parked his car in the parking garage, he realized he had accidentally locked his keys in the garage or, or in the car. And this was long before cell phones. So he went into the, the hospital and he called the church office. And when he explained his predicament, one of the other pastors offered to run by his house and pick up an extra set of keys and drive all the way down to Cincinnati where my friend could unlock his car. And so after visiting those church folks in the hospital, he returned to the parking garage to wait beside his car. And as he was standing there, a hospital security guard came by and asked my friend what was wrong. And he had explained that he had locked his keys in his car. And the guard pulled out one of those Slim Jim uh, lock pickers and he slid it into the door. And with one yank, he had that door unlocked. Now, my minister friend thanked him for his kindness, and the guard drove off. But now, my friend was sort of in a pickle. His fellow pastor was on his way, you know, halfway to Cincinnati by that point, and there was no way to call him and tell him to turn around. And he didn't want uh, that fellow to arrive on his errand of mercy, only to learn that he had made the trip in vain. Now, I don't know what you would have done, but my friend decided to walk back over to his car and lock the keys back in it. And sure enough, about 20 minutes later, the other staff member drove up and triumphantly handed my friend that extra set of keys. And my friend shook his hand and told him how much he appreciated his co-worker's kindness in making that 90-minute round trip, that journey of grace to Bailey Mount. Now, the reason my friend intentionally locked his keys back in the car was because he didn't want his co-worker's errand of mercy, errand of kindness, to be in vain. He didn't want to waste his grace. In our text today, Paul warns us about the potential for us to receive God's grace in vain. We read in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And then in chapter 6, beginning in verse number 1, we then, as workers together with him, also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in an acceptable time, I have heard you, and in the day of salvation, I have helped you. Now that's actually a quote out of Isaiah chapter 49. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Paul is warning us about receiving God's grace in vain. 
Because there is the possibility that we can actually waste God's grace. And Paul warns us about receiving God's grace in vain because there's a possibility that we can actually receive his, his grace in vain. Grace has been defined as God's unmerited favor. But that definition isn't enough to say that God's grace is unmerited favor is like saying that Niagara Falls is just a trickle of water. It's like saying the Grand Canyon is a ditch. It's like saying the Amazon River is a creek. Grace is so much more than unmerited favor. There is always a risk when we try to define grace. Philip Yancey has said that trying to define grace is like dissecting a frog in biology class. You can learn a lot about the frog, but in order to do it, you have to kill it first. By simply trying to define grace, we sort of kill its impact. We don't really need a definition of grace because we have something better. We have the demonstration of grace. Just look at the cross. A God-man becoming sin for me so that I might become the righteousness of God. Now, how do you respond to the grace of God? Do you live in a constant appreciation of it? Or do you receive God's grace in vain and waste it? That kind of reminds me of a story about a lady who was helping her mother-in-law clean out the attic. And they were sorting through all the items accumulated throughout the years. And the lady picked up a box that contained a brand new, never used before purse. And she asked her mother-in-law why she never used the purse. And the mother-in-law said, oh, said, somebody gave that purse for Christmas years ago. And I thought it was so hideous that I never used it. You can just throw it away. And the daughter-in-law was crushed because she recognized it as a purse she had given to her mother-in-law years earlier. By refusing to use the purse, the mother-in-law had received that gift in vain. Now, there are four ways we sometimes waste the grace of God. First of all, we waste the grace of God by relying on our own righteousness. See, Paul was aware he wasn't perfect, and he realized he had a need for grace. And here's how, this is his self-assessment. He said, you know, I'm the least of all the apostles, and I don't even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was within me. Uh, we read about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. See, Paul worked hard for God. But it wasn't to add grace. It was part of the effect that grace had upon him. He realized just how unworthy he was. And he wrote, I know that nothing good lives in me. That is my sinful nature. Remember our focus verse from last week? God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You know, when you think about it, a sinless Christ became sin for me so that I might receive his righteousness as a gift. But in spite of this glorious truth, many of us still hang on to the notion that there's something good about us that we can somehow add to the righteousness of God. A couple of years ago, I did a funeral for someone not affiliated with our church. And just before I spoke, there was a, a gifted soprano soloist who sang, 
amazing grace, how sweet the sound. And I noticed that she changed a word in that first verse. She sang, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a soul like me. And I wondered if I was the only one in that room who realized that she had changed that harsh word, wretch, to a much softer word, soul. You know, when John Newton wrote the song, he had become, he had been a former slave trader. He was guilty of some of the vilest sins imaginable. He had no trouble admitting that he was a wretch of the worst kind. The dictionary definition of wretch is a person considered to be mean, base, and despicable. And the fact that we're all wretchless, wretches, that's what makes the grace of God so amazing, mind-boggling, knocked down awesome. If we, you know, somehow believe that we're basically good-natured souls who only need just a little help from God, that puts grace, uh, it just sort of guts grace of its impact. And I'm afraid that far too many people are trying to improve their standing by God by creating their own righteousness. They're members of the Human Improvement Society. Well, the Christian life isn't about turning over a new leaf. It's a new life. The Christian life isn't about improving your flesh. It's about replacing it. Salvation is much more than a change in your life. It's an exchanged life. He takes my sins on himself and replaces my dirty rags righteousness with his white robe righteousness. Now, another way that we might waste the grace of God is by behavior that dishonors the Lord. The Bible says that for the grace of God that brings salvation teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. We read that in Titus chapter 2. God's grace is for wretches like me and you. But once we have been touched by the grace of God... He transforms our behavior. You know, when it comes to our conduct under grace, there are two extreme grace mistakes that can be made. First of all, license says, well, since I'm under God's grace, so I can sin all I want. And I'm afraid that grace has been misunderstood by a lot of folks. They think, well, God's grace has forgiven me of all my sins, past, present, and future, so I can just sin all I want, and I'm still saved. Jude warned that there would be people like that in the church. And he said they are godless men who change the grace of God into a license for morality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. There are some churches that no longer talk about sin and the blood atonement of Jesus Christ. Sin is no longer called wickedness. Instead, it's just simply referred to as a weakness. And their attitude is, well, live any way you want and we'll allow you to be a part of our church. And these churches are filling up with people who want to have Jesus, but they want to have their sin too. And I've got a name for those kinds of people. They are grace potatoes. Sort of like couch potatoes who are so lazy, they just sit around and watch TV. Grace potatoes aren't appalled by their own sin or anyone else's. This is a terrible prefer, uh, perversion of grace. Over in the book of Romans, in chapter 6, verse 1, Paul says, Shall we go on sinning so that grace may abound? By no means, no. We have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? You know, a few years ago when my daughters were in school, they attended the Christian school here in town. 
And I got to know some of the other local pastors in town because all of our kids went to school together. And one day I was talking to the local Southern Baptist pastor. And I was just sort of giving him a good-natured ribbing. And uh, I said, well, if I believed once saved, always saved, I would go out and sin all I want to. And he sort of looked at me kind of funny. He said, and why would you want to go out and sin? And my, I, it was like, ouch, my Baptist brother brought this truth and he schooled this church of God boy. Don't waste God's grace by using it as a license to sin. Now, there's another extreme here, and that is legalism. Legalism says, well, I must obey the rules in order to earn God's love. Legalism reduces Christianity to a set of rules to be obeyed instead of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It is the belief that I can earn God's favor by my rule keeping. And Paul addresses legalism in Galatia when he wrote, How is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable principles? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? You are observing special days and months and seasons and years. And I fear for you that somehow I have wasted my efforts on you. See, Paul cascaded them because they were still enslaved to all those religious rules and religious regulations and religious rituals. You can find some graceless, legalistic churches today. They expect members to change their behavior before they're going to be accepted in that church. And Christianity to them has been reduced to using a certain translation of the Bible, wearing certain kinds of clothing, wearing your hair a certain way, or whether or not you go to the movies. Uh, I heard of one pastor who was called to serve in a rural church, and he worked at a regular job in addition to pastoring the church. And he lived in the parsonage next door to the church, and one Sunday afternoon he decided to wash his wife's car because he didn't have time during the week. And that was a bad choice because before he finished the job, Two of the old deacons in the church drove up and told him that it was a sin to wash his car on the Lord's day and that he could no longer be their pastor. You see, that is legalism. And as a recovering legalist myself, I still slip into the fallacy of somehow thinking that God loves me less or more depending on how well I, I uh, perform for him. That's a waste of God's grace. A third way of looking at this, love says, because I am loved, I love God, so I want to obey him. Jesus said in John chapter 14, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. It all boils down to our motives. Why do we want to live? a pure, holy life? Well, the absolute best reason is because I realize how much God loves me. And as I love God in return, I want to obey him. I want to please him. Once there was a husband and a wife who really didn't love each other very much, and he was very demanding of her, so much that he gave her a list of things that he wanted done, and he insisted that she read them every day and follow them to the letter. And the list included demands like what time she should get up and when his breakfast should be, be served and exactly how much housework should be done. And after several long years of unhappiness, that husband died. And after some time, the woman fell in love with another man who dearly loved her. And they were soon married. And her new husband did everything that he could to make her feel happy and loved. And he continually showered her with compliments and 
tokens of his love. And one day, while she was cleaning the house, she found that old list from her first husband tucked away in a drawer. And as she read through that list, she realized even though her current husband hadn't given her a list, she was doing many things on that list anyway. She realized that she was so in love with her husband, she was doing those things out of love rather than obligation. That's the reason we should obey Jesus. You know, the devil wants to push us to extremes, but there's a wonderful balance <coughs> to grace. Don't sink into far extreme of license, thinking that since you're under grace, anything goes. Don't get petrified into legalism, reducing your faith to a list of rules and regulations, but stay centered on love as your primary motive. A third way that we can waste the grace of God is by failing to grow as a Christian. You know, we receive God's grace in vain, and we waste it when we simply consider grace to be a get-out-of-hell-free card. God instructs us in Second Peter chapter 3, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, one of the problems in the Corinthian church was spiritual immaturity. In the third chapter of his first letter, Paul chided them, saying they were a bunch of squalling spiritual babies who demanded constant attention and care. And he wrote that he had to feed them spiritual milk because spiritual meat would have upset their little tummies. You know, a baby that doesn't grow, that's tragedy. The sad truth is I'm afraid we've been around some Christians who are still spiritual babies. How long have you been a child of God? Is there any spiritual growth or progress in your life? Have you grown spiritually in the last 12 months? You know, if we equated spiritual growth to education, what grade are you in? spiritually speaking. Are you in elementary school, high school, or college? Are you still in spiritual kindergarten? See, spiritual growth isn't rocket science. You know, years ago, I learned a simple model of the disciples' cross that produces spiritual growth. Just imagine a cross. It has a vertical beam, and then it has a horizontal beam. The vertical beam represents our relationship with God. And when I move up the cross, that represents me talking to God, prayer. And when you move down the cross, that represents God talking to me through his word. When you move out the horizontal beam, it points to the two groups of people in the world, believers and those who have not yet put their faith in Christ. When I move out one direction horizontally, I relate to believers in by fellowship. That's what we're doing right now. When I move out the other direction of the cross, I relate to unbelievers by sharing my faith. Just as there are four extremities to the cross, there are the four habits of growing, maturing Christians. If you concentrate on participating in each of these four activities on a daily basis, prayer, Bible study, fellowship, and sharing your faith, I promise you will grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you remain a spiritual baby, you are wasting God's grace. Finally, I waste the grace of God by assuming that I can live without God's grace. Look again at verse 2 in our text. He said, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. You know, the most important word in that verse is the word now. 
The Bible says in James chapter 4, but he gives us more grace. That is why the scripture says God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. It doesn't say God gave us grace, past tense. It said God gives us grace. That's present tense. God gives us grace and then he gives us more grace. Receiving and depending on God's grace is a daily activity. It's not a one-time commodity that we access when we were first saved. On your very best day, you're never going to be good enough to be out of the need of God's grace. And on your very worst day, you're never going to be bad enough to be out of the reach of God's grace. You know, I must confess, for much of my Christian life, I received God's grace in vain because I thought I received his grace back when I was 11 years old, and that was all the grace that I needed. But the longer that I walk with the Lord, the more I appreciate the grace of God. And once the grace of God was just a doctrine to me, a truth in God's word that I could quote from memory, for by grace are you saved through faith. Of course, that's a wonderful truth. But the older I get, the more I cherish the grace of God in the present tense. I'm coming to realize that the grace of God is as vital to me as breathing. I could not exist for one moment without his grace. His grace is a powerful, life-sustaining reality in my life. I once heard a story about a man in Europe in the early years of the 20th century who dreamed of immigrating to America so he could start a new life. He scrimped and he saved, and every penny he earned he put away until he had enough money to book passage on a passenger ship to New York City. And as the day of his departure drew near, he packed all of his belongings into a tattered bag. And with the little money that he had left, he bought some cheese and a few crackers for the voyage. And as the ship departed, the man was excited. But after a couple of days, the cheese had become moldy and the crackers became soggy. And as he walked the deck of the passenger ship, he gazed into those portholes to see happy people in the dining rooms eating sumptuous meals, and that only made his hunger pains sharper. Another few days passed, and his hunger only intensified. It was torture to walk by the dining room and see and smell the delicious food being enjoyed by the other passengers. Finally, on the last day of the voyage before the ship docked, he was so famished that he approached a steward and he said, Please, sir, I'm starving, but I don't have any money. If you'll just give me some leftover food, I'll be glad to wash dishes or do any other chore to pay for the food. And the steward said, Well, let me see your ticket. And after examining the ticket, the steward said, Sir, this ticket includes all of your meals. You could have been eating every meal here in the dining room. And while that man had been suffering, he didn't realize that all the food he had seen had been available to him. In Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7, it speaks of the riches of the grace of God. All those riches are available to you now if you'll only claim them. God's grace is such a powerful, precious, amazing commodity that we should be careful we don't receive it in vain, that we never ever waste God's grace. You know, the most tragic way people receive God's grace in vain is if you aren't yet a follower of Jesus Christ, then you're receiving a message of grace right now. If you don't respond right now to God's grace by surrendering your life to him, then you're wasting his grace. You might be thinking, well, what's the rush? 
I've always got tomorrow. Are you sure about that? God's time for salvation is always now. The devil's time for salvation is always tomorrow. God says, trust me now. The Bible say, or, or the devil says, wait, you've got plenty of time. Whose voice are you going to listen to? Will you receive God's grace and forgiveness today? Let's pray together. Father, we come to you this morning. We thank you for our time together. We thank you for the truth of the word of God as it speaks to us. And Father, today I pray for all of us that I have joined in today who are hearing the things that I'm saying. Lord, I pray that you would apply those to our lives. Help us not to put off seeking the Lord, but help us, Lord, to uh, identify your grace. We don't want to waste your grace in our lives. Father, help us to just be thankful for your grace and, and help us to live by your grace. Father, we thank you and we praise you. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. This coming Sunday, we are continuing our short five-week Bible series out of the Old Testament book of Jonah. Jonah was an interesting character who was the only prophet who preached and ushered in revival. And he was unhappy about it. So we hope that you join us this week for the series Outrageous Grace as we look at the story of Jonah. Next Wednesday, we continue our live online Bible study on the book of 2 Corinthians. That's Wednesday mornings, 10.30 a.m. Eastern Time. Thanks again for joining us today. May God bless you as you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You are loved. We'll see you next time.